So let's get into it with our panelists um, and, and talk a little bit about the impact of the shutdown on these vital programs. Um, Laquita, let's start here. Sky's story, you know, I'm sure is, is too familiar to you. Your organization represents workers who work in food retail stores, processing plants around the country, and some government workers who work in and around the food system too. Uh, you were in the middle of things, both during the shutdown, um, as well as with implications for lost paychecks and lingering impacts on those lost paychecks and um, on SNAP recipients too, whose benefits were disrupted. What, what did you see in terms of the impact on the people that you represent? So just for a little bit of a uh, background, thank you. Um, we represent about 1.3 million workers across the country and in Canada. Uh, who work in food retail stores. These are folks who work in your local grocery stores, but also processing plants. Uh, we also represent folks in non-food retail. I like to say we get you dressed for dinner, put food on the table, and we also represent folks in distilleries, so we'll give you a nightcap. Uh, <laughs> But uh, this shutdown certainly hit home for us. We found ourselves at an interesting nexus uh, where uh, we had people who were directly impacted. If you guys think about the food that you all eat, uh, all of that food is federally inspected. For our workers who work in processing plants, those plants cannot operate without USDA inspectors along the line to ensure that the food is safe. Uh, there are safety checkpoints throughout that uh, plant. And these folks were deemed essential, which is great. So that ensured that the food was still safe that we were getting. Uh, but it also hit home because these people went to work every day and didn't get a paycheck. So for our workers who worked along the lines and were getting a paycheck, they actually found themselves in a situation of collecting funds to pay the inspectors so that they could still work and be able to provide for their families. So when you think about that, this not only you know, directly hit recipients, but it also hit everybody along, that food, along the food chain. So um, when we think about the direct impact though on recipients, um, folks at FNS did a great job of making sure that folks got their benefits when they were coming out early. What we found is that there was a short period of time and just an inadequate amount of time to communicate to recipients that, hey, we're, you're getting your benefits early, but they've got to last you throughout this period. Those conversations were happening in the checkout lines. And so you found that there, it was just a ripple effect throughout the whole food supply chain. So, and we're still feeling the effects of that. So it's, it impacted everywhere. Thank you. Uh, Diane Yantel, I want to turn to you and, and talk a little bit about housing. Um, housing stability is critical to food security for millions of Americans. At Feeding America, our own research shows that 60% of the people served by our network um, talk about having to make the impossible trade-off of paying for food or paying for housing. And there's research that shows that permanent and temporary housing subsidies contribute to better food security, um, at least uh, in the short term. Can you talk a little bit about the impact of the government shutdown on, uh, on housing programs and the kind of disruption that that caused and the impact that you see? Sure. Uh, thank you. And thanks for the opportunity to be here. And thank you all for the tremendous work that you do every day back in your communities. It's so important and so impactful. And I'm delighted to be here today. So first, just to say a little bit about the connection, as you say. You say very well the connections between housing security and food security. I think Matt Desmond, maybe somebody you've heard of, a, a well-known sociologist and a Pulitzer Prize winning author of a book, Evicted, who talked about how the rent eats first, right? Unlike all of the other bills that we have to pay every month or the expenses that we have, rent isn't negotiable and there's no way to sort of save or scrimp around the edges to save money. It's a lump sum that's due in the first of the month to keep a roof over our heads. So people wisely prioritize that expense and then when you are extremely low income and you're paying at least half of your income every month, for that roof over your head. You have very little left for all of life's other necessities. And certainly research is growing to show the, the, that when people are severely cost burdened, when they have such little income left for the other expenses, they're making trade-offs, especially around food. And they're paying less for food altogether. They're eating less, like we heard Sky say, or they're able to buy less healthy food, less nutritious food, which has long-term impacts, as you all well know, for especially children. 
So the, the shutdown, unfortunately, had did some real harm to low-income people and to the housing programs that serve them. So within HUD, there are three major rental assistance programs. There's the public housing program, which was not impacted by the shutdown. And then there's housing choice vouchers, or Section 8 vouchers, and there's a program called project-based rental assistance. There's also in USDA a much smaller project-based rental assistance programs. For those project-based rental assistance programs, it's basically HUD and USDA together. They have thousands of individual contracts with owners around the country who, because of the contract and the money that comes from the federal government, set aside a certain percentage of units to be affordable to extremely low-income renters. So during the shutdown, about 700 of those contracts expired, and more were expiring every day. And when they expired, for most of those contracts, the lease agreements expired as well. So the residents in those properties were highly vulnerable to increased rents or even evictions. And we did see a few owners in Arkansas, Mississippi, Louisiana, who put notices on their tenants' doors saying the federal government's not paying its share of the rent, so you need to pay it all. And you need to pay it by next week or you're gonna be evicted. And we were able to, we heard those stories and we shone a really too bright media spotlight on those owners and they eventually backed off of their threats. In the Section 8 voucher program, this is a program where tenants get a voucher and they use it to be able to rent an apartment on the private market. They pay about 30% of their income towards their rent and the government pays the rest. So we also heard from residents, Section 8 voucher holders, who ha and all of these tenants, I should say, you know, they're seniors, they're people with disabilities, they're working families, they're all extremely low income. So in the voucher program, we heard about people who were having monthly leases and their landlords were saying, we're not gonna renew your lease for February, this is on January 20th, uh, because of the federal shutdown, of the government shutdown, because the federal government's not paying its bills, so we don't see this program as reliable anymore. So again, we were able to shine a spotlight. Those landlords backed off, those tenants stayed in their homes, but those were just the ones that we heard about, right? And it can, I'm certain that there were more. And the longer term damage is harder to quantify at this moment, but we know it's real, and we're just starting to get, get a sense, I think, of just how deep that damage was. Because for each of those programs I mentioned, they rely on the private market to function. And when the private market, when landlords or owners start to see the government not paying its bills and they see the funding is volatile, they're gonna start walking away from the program and they already are. And in the voucher program, it's already challenging to find landlords to participate in that program. And we know that it'll become even more challenging, unfortunately, because of the shutdown. Thank you, Diane. Uh, I'll turn to you, Diane Schanzenbach, and, and you've done extensive research on poverty and issues related to poverty through the years and on programs that support low-income individuals and families like SNAP and the, the long-term impacts and, and outcomes that can be expected from those programs. What sort of an impact did you uh, see? What sort of an impact do you anticipate because of the government shutdown on those sorts of programs? Sure, so for me, this government shutdown really highlighted um, some issues that we, everyone in this room knows quite a lot about, but um, the media finally, I think, rediscovered a little bit, right? So a couple of things. One is that really highlighted the number of people who live paycheck to paycheck. And as the flip side of that, or sort of uh, part and parcel of that, is the real inadequacy of the SNAP benefits. You know, we know that people are running out of benefits every month before the next benefit comes, comes on. Uh, but now we're able to see, you know, just what dire straits people were in when we weren't sure what's going to happen. And then, of course, you know, the early issuance and then the longer, longer, you know, time period between those. All of these things, I think, was very useful to highlight so that as we move forward together as a nation, we can make sure that we're not, you know, balancing our budget or, you know, doing things like this on the backs of our most vulnerable citizens. So that's one thing that I think it really highlighted well. Another is, you know, we are in conversations about um, implementing more work requirements under SNAP. And I think this whole experience really highlighted the volatility of employment for even for federal workers, right? Let alone all of the contractors and other people who are in, impacted by that. So we can see in, you know, um, data set after data set that um, the 
types of people who uh, use SNAP are more likely to have uh, you know, more spells of unemployment, um, more volatile hours, et cetera. We need to worry about that for their economic well-being. But then if you want to layer on top of that draconian work requirements that will punish people for having bad luck, you know, losing a job, losing hours at work, uh, well, that just doesn't make any sense at all. Um, you know, so uh, before I came on stage, uh, my friend from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities reminded me that this really, we, there was great, um, many successes here, you know. So it was very unfortunate that um, SNAP was caught up in something that just wasn't even about SNAP at all. And that because of the work of a lot of people in this room, you know, and FNS and the states, you know, we were able to, you know, stave off, I think, some of the worst of what we were, you know, concerned about happening. So that was a real success story, and hopefully not something we'll need to repeat. Um, but I think, again, and it, it sort of highlights for me, you know, that SNAP is vitally important to both people and places. You mentioned a little bit about this uh, research that I've done on uh, looking at the long-term long impacts of having access to SNAP during childhood. I hear that you all um, got some of that face-to-face uh, -face with the lunchtime speaker yesterday, um, that it can change a child's trajectory. We find that having access to SNAP in early life increases the likelihood that a kid graduates from high school by 18 percentage points. They then grow up to be um, more economically self-sufficient. They also grow up to be healthier. Um, complementary studies have found that it also improves health in the short run. Of course, it's not surprising to anyone that it uh, reduces food insecurity. It um, reduces the likelihood that you'll default on other bills. Um, you know, it improves dietary quality, et cetera. We can really measure this. That's just, you know, just for kids, but we can also talk about similar impacts for the elderly, for disabled, for working adults, for unemployed adults, and so on. And I'll talk a little bit more, I think, later about the impact on places. But of course, we know that um, these benefits are also vitally important to local economies. Um, you know, a year ago, I was here um, sharing a brief keynote address. And, and there were significant threats to the SNAP program at that time. And we recognized, I think, Feeding America Network distributes meals to tens of millions of Americans each year, uh, nearly five billion meals, and yet the SNAP program for every meal that's distributed by our network accounts for about 12. Mm -hmm. And we talked about the fact that even small cuts to that program could have a boat swamping effect on the charitable sector. You know, that's one of the things that we started to see in this short period of time was members of our network and the agencies that they support and work side by side with having to step up dramatically in a very short period of time to try to respond to a very intense and unprecedented need. We need strong and vibrant programs. Let's focus for the next few minutes a little bit on what sorts of changes would you all like to see in these vital programs to make them even more resilient, not just in times of crisis like this, but for the long term. And Laquita, maybe we could start with you. Yeah. What would you like to offer to the audience? Uh, so one of the things, uh, you kind of alluded to it already, but if we really think about it, SNAP benefits as they stand right now are inadequate. Uh, the average benefit per person uh, per meal is about a dollar and forty cents. So if you imagine not only trying to live off that, but also in a situation now where you have to stretch that out um, a month's worth of benefits for up to six weeks, um, it's just no way that people can actually do that. Uh, I think if we had a system where benefits were greater and covered a greater percentage uh, than seventy percent um, of you know, a person's budget right now, uh, families would be better equipped to handle, you know, a situation of a shutdown. Um, if SNAP benefits covered a recipient's entire monthly food budget, about 30 billion more in benefits annually, it would yield a bill, about 54 billion in economic activity throughout the food chain. You alluded to that, and I like to point it out because our workers are hired in the communities in which they live. So we employ people who live and work in these communities. Uh, it gives them full-time employment. They're able to uh, fend for themselves and you know, provide a benefit for folks and a service to the community. It's an economic multiplier. So I think when we talk about SNAP, we have to think of it in that sense. So I, I think if we, if anything, we have to make sure that these benefits increase and, and there isn't a, a threat to them. So I think if we look at it in that sense and expand uh, the percentage of what's covered for somebody's monthly food budget, I think that's a good start. Thank you. <clears throat> um, 
And Diane Schanzenbach, I'll turn back to you, and, and if you could offer some perspective on ways to strengthen some of these vital programs. Sure, absolutely. I think SNAP is a really well-designed program. I've spent my whole career studying it. Uh, and so, I, really, when I look at the threats I see, too, um, you know, and I know you wanted me to frame this in a positive, but I just have to be worried about the, the sure. threats on the horizon. The first is really these work requirements. Uh, um, you know, I think we all, in principle, agree that we want people to be employed, and I'm really impressed with the work that I see done in job training. For example, the Greater Chicago Food Depository took me on a tour. They do are doing great work, but that you can't combine that with flawed proposals, which then you know, require 20 hours a week, you know, month in and month out, and you know, punish people if their hours get cut, if they lose a job, if you know, their health declines, you know, and they, they need to um, step away from employment for a little while. So we did some calculations, and what we learned was that the majority of people who would have been harmed under um, tighter uh, work requirements were workers, workers who had variability in hours and employment. Among the non-workers, the overwhelming majority were people who were not working because of either health issue or disability issue. And those typically aren't the types of people that you can then get to join the workforce by taking away their food. <laughs> um, you heard it here first. <laughs> Uh, the other, uh, I, I just learned that, uh, you know, another sort of, you know, uh, looming cloud uh, on the distance is um, a potential threats to what are called, what's called categorical eligibility. Um, and that is um, waving, you know, I won't get too far into the weeds, but what I can tell you is if we get rid of categorical eligibility, the people that will be hurt are overwhelmingly uh, working families with children. And that's not, like, uh, nobody has those policy preferences. Thank you. And, and Diane Yantel, from the housing program perspective, what would you like to see? So, uh, well, the first thing I'd like to see is no harm done to the programs that exist sure. already, especially with a, a HUD secretary who's a physician. You know, we often say, do no harm. Uh, it's not working sometimes <laughs> because <laughs> about a year ago, uh, yeah, about a year ago, Secretary Carson, one of his bi first big initiatives was actually to propose work requirements um, and rent increases for, in, in some cases, tripling rents for the most vulnerable households in HUD subsidized housing. Uh, so we were able to protect against those kind of harmful changes being implemented, but certainly expect those to come back again this year. I'm sure you're aware and may have heard already, but uh, OMB Director Mick Mulvaney sent a directive to all administrative agencies saying that they should look for ways to require work in any social safety net programs. And we'll be seeing that throughout agencies and throughout programs uh, in, the, in the next budget that's proposed by this administration. So certainly we need to protect uh, the people who are living in programs, in these HUD subsidized programs, who by the way overwhelmingly are seniors or people with disabilities or they are working, but they're working really low wage jobs and the kind of jobs where it's difficult to cobble together enough hours in a week or in a month to make ends meet. So we have to protect the programs. There are ways to improve existing programs to make them more accessible for families with young children, to make sure that families with young kids are able to use, for example, their Section 8 vouchers and move to neighborhoods with better schools or access to transportation. And those are changes that we're seeking as well. But the biggest change that we seek to the programs, frankly, is, to, is more money to expand them. Um, you know, we're in the midst of a really severe housing crisis that's most harming the lowest income people. Our research at the coalition shows that we have a shortage of over seven million homes affordable and available to the lowest income people. So another way of saying that is for every 100 of the lowest income seniors, people with disabilities, families, there's just 35 homes that are affordable and available to them. And because of chronic underfunding of the programs that work, we have a system today where only one in every four households that are eligible for and in need of housing assistance gets any help at all. So 75% of people who need housing assistance and are eligible for, they're the folks who are adding their names to you know, years, sometimes decades long waiting lists, hoping to win what's essentially a housing lottery. That's what we have in our country. So we have programs that work. We have proven effective solutions 
to end homelessness and end housing insecurity. Programs like the Section 8 voucher program, National Housing Trust Fund program, and others. And what we most need, the only thing we really lack in this country when it comes to ending homelessness and ending housing instability, because we have the data, we have the resources, certainly as a country, and we have the solutions, but we lack the political will to actually fund those solutions at the scale necessary. You know, um, several of you mentioned, uh, Laquita, you talked a little bit about the economic impact of investing in the SNAP program. You talked about the econ economic impact of the housing programs. You know, the, the critics can say we're, we're, we're asking for significant increases in budgets in, in times when it can be difficult to balance the budget. Can, can some of you talk a little bit to some of the macroeconomic effects? Now, I know you've studied this a little bit, Diane. Can you talk a little bit about some of the macroeconomic effects of investing in some of these vital programs? Sure, absolutely. Uh, so one of the most important, important uh, macroeconomic tools that we have is, especially when there are economic downturns, we need the government to be able to get money into the local area and do it quickly. And so, you know, that's why during recessions we talk about building, you know, highways and things like that. During the Great Recession, the stimulus dollars that had the biggest impact was that temporary increase to SNAP benefits. So we know from, from experience, from theory, from practice, et cetera, that um, in, in the Congressional Budget Office will say that um, the two most important fiscal stimulus are the Medicaid program and, and SNAP. And so as we you know, are you know, continuing to process what happened as part of the Great Recession and think about what's going to happen next, um, I'm you know, aligned with a lot of other economists who are trying to make sure that we don't do any more damage to the SNAP program, and in fact, we think we could do some things to make it even more pro-cyclical, potentially um, expand benefits You know, when there are economic downturns. Why is that? It's because the, those extra dollars that go into SNAP families' pockets get spent very, very quickly in the local economy, and so that's where we get these numbers, like every $5 in new SNAP benefits translates into $9 in local economic activity. You know, because they're spending it at the grocery store, and that means that the grocery stores, you know, get to keep all their baggers fully employed, and you know, they don't have to lay anybody off, et cetera, et cetera. It is a multiplier effect, and that is tremendously important, and is completely separate from the other important piece, which is, of course, I would like to think about SNAP benefits also as being an investment in children, because of those reasons that we talked about about before. So we've talked about the positive impacts in terms of individuals, households, and crisis ongoing, positive macroeconomic impacts, but the thing we're lacking is the political will. Can you offer some, maybe some encouragement, some thoughts, some advice? Diane Yentel, you brought this up, maybe back to you with some thoughts about how we develop the collective political will. Yeah, I'd love to, and, and to add on to some of the economic costs, and it's related to how we build the political will, I think, um, you know, we're, we're again, with the lens of housing and housing insecurity, that we're learning and we have growing research showing just how central housing affordability is to the outcomes of so many other sectors. We're paying for homelessness and housing insecurity one way or another. We can pay for it by investing in solutions to make homes affordable for low-income people, or we can pay for it through lost hours in the education system, through um, poor health, through nutrition ailments. You know, when people are affordably housed, our health improves, our kids do better in school, we earn more over our lifetimes, we even live longer. I'll just, I saw Children's Health Watch here before and I just wanna give a shout out to a report they did uh, recently, last year I think, and they found that over 10 years, we'll spend over $110 billion in avoidable healthcare costs because of housing instability. So imagine if we were to invest a fraction of that into housing affordability. So one of the ways I think that we, we build political will is by taking this research, taking this increasing understanding of the intersectionality of all of these issues and working together to elevate the solutions. In the housing world, you know, we have been for decades calling for greater investments in the solutions that work. And People who care about housing can't be the only ones calling for more investments in housing. It has to go beyond housers. And so uh, last year we launched a campaign that we're thrilled to have FRAC as part of the leadership team uh, leading this coalition called Opportunity Starts at Home. And it's about exactly that. It's about leaders in other 
sectors from the, the, the hung, anti-hunger, anti-poverty, faith-based, civil rights, local cities, education, health, joining together to say we need greater investments in affordable housing to solve these crises. So I think that's one way we build the political will. We expand the coalitions, we expand the partners that we're working with together. The other that I'll just mention briefly is it's really as basic and as simple as helping low-income people participate in our democracy. So in, in the housing field, again, when we look at the breakdown between who registers to vote and who shows up to vote, the differences between renters and homeowners are stark. And it's even more so when we break it down by income, below $20,000 or over $100,000. There's like a 30% difference in who's actually showing up to vote. And there's all sorts of reasons for that, right, that we can talk about in a different discussion. But you know, when we ask ourselves, like, what's it going to take for politicians to prioritize the needs of low-income renters, for example, and we look at those numbers, it's so obvious what it's going to take. We have to have, find a way to change laws, organize, work with people so that more low-income people are able to show up at the polls. That's when politicians will really start paying attention to their needs and prioritizing them. And I guess uh, I'll ask Laquita um, or Diane, you know, does this, uh, maybe this government shutdown would shine a light on just how many people are living paycheck to paycheck. Does it give us a moment to try to build some collective political will? Does either, would either of you like to comment on how we might build that? Yeah, I think this gives us the perfect opportunity to build political will. Uh, I think one thing that it showed us is it gives a different face to the usual argument. We have to call people out on the facts. So you've got this narrative, and I, I, I say I like to be in a room when a politician is like, we really need to put people back to work and get them working. And it was like, I represent people who get up every day and go to work. They work in retail. Their hours fluctuate because they want to cover a PTA meeting or because they have a child who's ill. So if they don't hit 20 hours that week, that shouldn't disqualify them because, and it doesn't fit with your, the narrative that you're trying to put out there. So I think it's important for all of us in this room, I think you were right about the diversity of coalition building. Uh, I call out a lot of our employers to say, go in there and talk to them about, these are people who get up and go to work every day. Uh, and I, I think we just need to make sure that we're uh, making sure that the narrative is accurate. Uh, and we need to be loud about it. I think that this gives us the perfect opportunity uh, to do just that, so. Thank you. Um, we have a question from the audience, uh, and I'll, um, I guess maybe, Diane, I'll invite you to take a shot at this first, and then anyone else who'd like to. How can we reframe the moral argument when we think about SNAP and work, and if the programs increase dependency? Right, well, I don't think there's any evidence that the program's increasing dependency. Like, there's just, I think that is like full stop. Um, and, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, but based on really nerdy data, right? So a, a couple of things. One is that, you know, in our study of um, early child, or, you know, access during childhood and later life outcomes, we were able to do the first study that looks at the causal impact of having access to a social benefit program in childhood, does that actually make you more likely to be on it as an adult? The answer is no, it makes you less likely. I mean, the reason it makes you less likely is because then you're able to do things like invest in your education, finish high school, et cetera, and those are the tools you need to be able to you know, go on and do, and do more. Um, so then you know, one other sort of aspect of this, just sort of laying out the facts and what the research is starting to show. Um, there are not many studies out there about um, the work requirements in uh, ABODs, but the ones that are coming out so far, I think every single one is showing either no incentive effect, it's not getting people to go back to work if they um, lose access to food stamps, it sort of you know, co comes back to our earlier thing, taking away food doesn't actually make people um, you know, suddenly go, go to work. What it does though is knock a lot of people off the program, and so it, it seems to be just uh, you know, causes a lot of harm to them, but doesn't doesn't benefit them, and so that just there's not empirical facts behind that idea. 
Um, always important to bring facts into Sorry. the conversation, so thank you. <laughs> Especially as we head to Capitol Hill. Um, another question from the audience, and this has to do with um, grandparents raising grandchildren, several generations who are living together, uh, supporting one another, and, and thinking about how the programs can better support those families today, but also thinking maybe a little bit about, you can comment on either of these aspects, the short-term ways programs can better support families in those situations, but also maybe the multi-generational effects where we see broadening economic inequality over time uh, for people at the sort of the lowest economic rung of society. So any thoughts or suggestions on ways programs that we've talked about this afternoon can better support families in those circumstances? So sure, I'll add on. That's a great question. And um, also just sort of adding on to the previous question, they're related somewhat. So one, I think um, when we talk about the how do we make the case for the programs that matter, um, I think facts do matter. And I think uh, education about really basics about our economy and how it works and who it's working for and who it's not are important to break down these ideas of dependence or, or, or over-dependence. You know, another one of the studies that we put out at the coalition, we come up with what we call the housing wage, which is how much somebody has to earn an hour just to be able to afford to rent a modest two or one bedroom apartment. And the housing wage nationally last year was $20.20 an hour for a two bedroom apartment and over $17 an hour for a one bedroom apartment. And when you look at the jobs that our economy is producing, we find that, this is from the Department of Labor, seven out of 10 of the jobs that are projected to have the greatest growth over the next 10 years pay less than what it costs to rent a one bedroom apartment. So it's not that people aren't working hard enough, it's that jobs don't pay enough to afford the rent. And I think it's really important that we, that we, that we emphasize that. And in terms, in terms of the question of grandparents raising grandchildren, I think that it's a really important one. There are programs, sort of niche programs within uh, public housing and within vouchers to assist with those type of households. But really, to me, that's an example of need that is equal to equally important to all of the other examples of need that we can come up with different types of household formation or particularly vulnerable populations that need housing. All of the programs that I mentioned earlier that work to make housing affordable for lowest income people can work for those types of families and others who are in need. So really it's about we need more of what works to assist those kind of families and others. Thank you. And Laquita or? Uh, I was just going to piggyback or kind of jump back to the other yeah. question and just say that SNAP works the way it's supposed to. We've seen over a period of time where the the total time that people remain on the program has shortened over time. People aren't here, you know, staying on the program beyond the time that they actually need it. They use it for what they need it for to get back up on their feet uh, for whatever reasons, but this program works. And I think that we have to be okay with saying that out loud and kind of pointing back to the facts that show just that, so. Thank you for sharing that and, and I think I, and can I, can I jump on that? I mean, sure. I agree. I mean, we've seen the case ro caseloads decline as we've as this you know recovery has gained more and more steam, and you know, some people have been com you know complaining why hasn't it declined more quickly? And it's you know a lot of times these are workers are the first to lose their jobs, the last to get their jobs back, and that's why we need a thriving program like SNAP to you know to help them in bad times. You know, we, we've been having a conversation uh, with the Feeding America leadership team, the Feeding America board as well, about trying to continue on this journey from commitment to outputs to, to outcomes for clients, for people facing hunger, for the communities in which they live. And the question that we've been asking is, where, what does the empirical evidence say about what uh, helps promote food security? And the number one answer is always a strong SNAP program. And that has become, for us, the line in the sand. We've got to have a strong SNAP program. Um, so thank you for sharing your perspective on, on those questions from the audience as well. I want to turn to each of you for perhaps just a closing uh, thought, a brief thought that you'd like to share with everybody as they prepare to head to Capitol Hill and continue on with their conversations here at the conference this week. Um, why don't we start with you, Laquita, if we could. 
Uh, well, I actually just wanted to um, give a heartfelt thanks to you all for the work that you do every day uh, and for coming here and going up to the hill tomorrow. I think so many people feel isolated uh, and like they don't have a voice, especially now. This has been an exhausting administration, let's just be honest. Like it's just been, <laughs> uh, and as somebody who has to get up and do it every day, I appreciate that there is such a great, like large, robust crowd who's energized and who will go up there and do it tomorrow. So I thank you for the work that you're doing in the States. And I just wanna say when you go up there tomorrow, uh, for those who couldn't make it, tell their stories, uh, tell the stories of your organization, but tell those folks stories who aren't here and let them know just what this program and, uh, and the other programs means to everybody. So that's all. Thank you, and Diane Shines about Yeah, I will, I will echo that great thank you to you all, and I will just remind you as you go out there that the SNAP program it helps people and it helps the local economy, and we can come up with all sorts of underlying facts for that, but that's what it boils down to, people and the local economy. Thank you, Diane. So I just add my thanks and my, my, um, my urging that you just, that you keep doing what you're doing, that you, it, it has been exhausting. It's been an exhausting couple of years, and the threats keep coming, and they keep getting broader, and they are against the entire social safety net that all the programs that matter to the people we care most about, or, the, or to us. But we're actually making progress, despite it all, despite these extraordinary challenges. We are moving forward. We're, make, we're building new bridges. We're making new alliances. I mean, I'm delighted to be here today talking with you all about affordable housing and about the connections and to have us show up more for the issues you care about and hopefully for you all to find a way to show up for the issues that we do because they're all so interconnected. And when we work together, as we increasingly are, against these threats, I think we're going to have a, a pretty powerful impact. So please keep at it, and thank you for all that you do. And I'd just like to, co uh, to close the, the discussion this afternoon by echoing that thank you to all of you. Thank you for your commitment, for your energy, and for your passion for this mission. And please join me in thanking our guest panelists this afternoon.